Cameron Sinclair. I'm co-founder of an organization called Architecture for Humanity. And the role of the organization is to provide architecture and construction services for communities in need, which means that we um, engage uh, design and construction professionals uh, to help rebuild after a natural disaster or in areas of systemic poverty. And uh, I'm here um, teaching a, a masterclass uh, at UIC um, on uh, sustainable emergency architecture. But the reality is that, you know, in architecture there are a lot of mistakes in architecture. You know, it's 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 like painting a painting. You know, once you're you've started, there's no stopping, and the, it's very hard to make corrections. Um, in the areas that we work in. Um, especially in places that have been hit by a natural disaster, we, we have to make sure that we're utilizing the right materials, um, that we're engaging local labor, creating jobs, and that we're aware of certain dynamics. This most powerful earthquake in the region's history has crippled the country. Now, measuring why Haiti? It was the, the worst quake. Pure emergenza da Haiti per l'epidemia di colera che sarebbe arrivata sino alla capitale Porto-Prince. Efforts to rebuild this country have failed miserably. Only five percent. Well, there's a massive constraint of capacity from the Haitian community. Haiti has no military. Like any any country with a military could clear that rubble in a week. Um, 13 of the 15 ministries collapsed, killing everyone inside. Um, people are grieving. You can't just say, "Listen, I'm sorry, you lost half your family members. Come on, we got work to do." You know, it takes a while to get through that grieving period. And, and for expectations of the international um, community is unrealizable for a country like Haiti. 70% of architecture is done outside of the West, and 70% of all architects are taught in the West. So there's a big disconnect between the work that's needed and the way people are trained. You know, every architect is taught how to build an opera house or a museum, but they're not taught how to work within an indigenous community on low-cost construction. So, you know, I think there has to be an outlet for that. And our organization only became large, not because we did anything exceptional, but we just gave the opportunity for architects to do this work. So you have to be entrepreneurial. I think architecture in general has forgotten how to be business-like. We are seduced by our own creativity, that we are some sort of, we're so good at designing that, that people should be pleased to have our, our creativity. But the fact is, if you really want to um, make a difference, you have to go out there and engage communities, and not only communities, but funding. Like, we go and find the funding. I'm ruthless, and, and I do it in a way that's completely shameless because I'm going to fight to get the funding so the community gets the buildings they need. And whatever I need to do, within reason, I'll do it. Because um, I would rather uh, a community get a well-built, well-designed building than the sort of junk that gets thrown at them by development. You know, we as architects tend to look up at the building and forget what's down on the ground. And I think there's a huge, you know, for me, rather than seeing that as a problem, I see that as a huge opportunity, and that architects not only have to fly to, shouldn't fly to Africa or go to Haiti or South America to find problems in which to solve. They can they can tackle ones in their own city. Like we've entered a, a society where we're so disconnected from each other, we've forgotten what society means. Whereas you can begin to start, you know, when I work in a village, a small village in Sri Lanka or in India or in Malawi. No one has a computer, the, nobody has a radio, but the, the sense of life and the sense of interconnectivity in that village is stronger than anywhere else I find in the West. <laughs>